the Value of Music panel discussion. I am Jeff Kidd. I work with the Network Infrastructure and Services Department here at Virginia Tech. October's survey and this panel are intended to promote awareness of and discussion about creators of and, and consumers of music. We are very pleased, pleased to co-present the survey and the panel discussion with our partners at Future of Music Coalition. FMC is a nonprofit organization that works to ensure a diverse musical culture where artists flourish and are compensated fairly for their work and where fans can find the music they want. We have studied the Hokies' perspectives of music scene with the survey, and this evening we'll take that next step and engage in a discussion of today's music environment and its future. I'll introduce our friends from FMC. Jaya Kapadia is, a future, is the Future Music Coalition's uh, Chief Operating Officer and Events Director, and has been with the organization since 2006. Prior to moving to Washington, D.C., she spent several years coordinating tours at Concerted Efforts, noted Boston Roots music booking agency for artists such as Orchestra Baobab, Booker T and the MGs, and Yatka and others. She has also traveled internationally managing tours with Pape Sheikh and the Holmes Brothers. At FMC, Chaya organizes events, manages organizations' finances, maintains the website, and addresses staffing needs. She received a BA from Emerson College with a major in audio engineering and was also previously an in-house engineer for, uh, with excuse me, WERS FM Boston. She keeps an occasional personal blog under the moniker of Liquid Sunshine. Chaya, are you uh, in, back in the back? Thank you. Kristen Thompson is a consultant for Future Music Coalition. She currently co-directs FMC's Artist Revenue Streams Research Project, which is examining changes in musicians' sources of income. She is co-owner of Simple Machines, an independent record label, which released over 70 records and CDs in the early and mid-90s. She also played guitar in the band Tsunami, which in released four albums between 1991 and 1997, and toured extensively. She currently lives near Philadelphia with her husband, Brian, a concert promoter, and their son, where she plays, also plays guitar in the lady-powered band, Ken. Please put your hands together and welcome our Value of Music moderator, Kristen Thompson. So much, Jeff. That's awesome. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Kristen. Um, so um, I th we're going to just run through some of the findings from this survey that we do uh, with Virginia Tech students, and then we're going to bring up our panelists and have a conversation about it. And since there's, um, since we are sort of a manageable group, we can also sort of take Q and A as the questions come up. Um, so a little bit of background on this. Um, we first met Jeff. Um, at our Future of Music Policy Summit in DC in October of 2010. We do this event every year in DC where we bring together music and law and technology and policy people. And we had done a panel at that event about um, the changing um, responsibilities that uh, administrators like Jeff have on college campuses. Um, there was a piece of legislation that passed called the Higher Education Act um, that made um, their responsibilities you know, greater, especially in, with regards to copyright infringement. And since uh, Virginia Tech serves as a broadband provider, it's also serving thousands of students. And so we were doing this panel that involved other educator and IT folks, and there were a couple of students in the, um, in the room watching the panel, and one of the, we asked them, you know, we we're talking about access to music, and we said, well, how do you guys access music? And the kids were like, yeah, we just use, we just use YouTube. And I had sort of heard that from other college kids, and so we were curious to see if this was beyond anecdotal. You know, what, what do, how are 
kids, how are college students um, accessing music, how are they acquiring it, how are, what are their music preferences like as far as that goes. So that's why we, we've done this survey. Um, we just carried on the conversation and we're just curious about what students, how the changing behavior um, is in regards to music listening and acquisition. Um, so we'll look at the results. Um, just a little caveat, you know, this is sort of a, a technical look at music listening and acquisition, I admit that. Um, it's, um, we all have emotional connections with music and how we value music, I'm sure, is some, very different for everybody in this room. Um, and it, for the most part, it probably has nothing to do with money. So I want to keep that in mind that we really understand that everyone has a different way to value music. Um, this is just one way to look at it. So we'll just look at this tonight. So just a little bit about the survey's actual, you know, the, the sort of basic statistics for it. About 1,300 people started it and just over 1,000 finished it. And we had um, a decent you know, array of folks take it. Most of the folks lived on campus, which is good just because uh, we assume that they're mostly using the college's broadband, if that's the case. Um, almost all of them were undergrad students. And um, interestingly, 35% said they were either musicians or songwriters, which is really interesting. Um, so. One other thing about the way the survey was set up, um, you know, we know that there's ubiquitous internet access on campuses like this. And so we were curious about how having access to the internet has changed um, the choices that, music, that um, students make about how they're accessing and listening and consuming music. So those are sort of like the umbrella questions as we did this. And the first thing we asked is, you know, how often are you listening? And students listen to music frequently, which shouldn't be a surprise. Um, but 74% of respondents were listening to nine or more hours a week, and for a smaller percentage, 30% of those folks were listening to more than 24 hours a week. Um, when you compare this with other behavior of citizens, um, the average U.S. citizen spends about the same amount of time watching TV a week of, as 24 hours, so you can see that music plays a prominent role in students' lives, the folks, at least the folks who took the survey. Um, second thing, um, when you ask them about the devices that you use, whoops, I put away my notes. Um, the devices that they use, you can tell that even though there's a variety of things, are clearly they're, um, they prefer things that are able to um, play digital content. Um, from the computer all the way down to the iPhone, um, those are dominating that results. Um, clearly there's some people who have home stereos and whatever, but what I took away from this is that they flavor digital content, especially that the kind of um, devices that are portable. The second big finding was that um, the free, when you asked students about how they're listening to music, the free streaming music services that offer some diversity and some customization are the most popular sources of music listening. So if you ask folks, and when students answer this question, they can answer more than one thing. It could, didn't have to pick one thing. So um, the top of the list, if you can't see it, people are listening a lot or sometimes to YouTube and then Pandora and then the free streaming services like MySpace or the free version of Spotify, terrestrial radio, then below that is MP3 blogs, Sirius XM satellite radio, music related podcasts and at the very bottom, paid subscription services. Those would be things like Rhapsody, um, the premium version of Spotify, and things like that. So what I take away from this is that um, we can talk a bit about what this means. Um, hold on a second. If you look at just the a lot question, you know, it's, again, it's YouTube slash YouTube Vivo and then Pandora and other non-interactive webcasts that really dominate. Um, those are free streaming music services. Um, heavy listeners, the folks who are listening to more 24 hours a week, uh, have the same listening preferences. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about Pandora and YouTube and see if you guys agree with this. Um, so, based on that question, 61% um, of the respondents listen a lot or sometimes to Pandora or other webcasts. And I, this doesn't surprise me just because of what I know about Pandora that um, you know, it's a free streaming music service that offers some sort of control 
over what you um, listen to, and its algorithm continues to learn from you as you, pl um, as you play more music and thumbs up, thumbs down, the things that you like and don't like. Um, so that level of customization seems to resonate with people. The things that Pandora doesn't do um, because of the rules about webcasting is that you couldn't play a whole album in a row, and you can only do thumbs up or thumbs down three times in an hour, but perhaps those parameters are big enough for people to feel like, hey, that's a good enough solution. I can't play the entire Bob Dylan record, but I can play Bob Dylan and stuff that's like Bob Dylan and maybe discover new songs. So I have a sense that that's why so many people like Pandora, I mean, it's got 100 million users in the United States and 36 million active users. So um, it's, it's doing quite well, and I can imagine that it would be um, successful on a campus like this that has ubiquitous internet access. The second thing is YouTube and Vivo. This again makes sense to me that it's a free service and in fact probably has more stuff than Pandora ever could have because it allows user generated content to be uploaded. Um, the behind the scenes, behind the scenes, um, behind the scenes um, YouTube has this content ID system that allows it, um, allows rights holders to request takedowns if they really don't want stuff that actually belongs to them to be up on the web, up on YouTube. Um, but the really interesting thing about this, which um, I think YouTube was really smart about, is that if a rights holder really wants something taken down, they have, they have three choices. They can request the takedown and the, the um, track or the video will be taken down. The second thing that YouTube offers them is the data that's around the um, views and the plays so that the rights holder can get the data from the plays. And the third thing that you can do if you're a rights holder, you can monetize the airplay. Even if it's a user generated video that happens to have your song as your soundtrack, you can make money on the ads and the pre-roll and the lower third stuff that is displayed along with the user generated content. So I think this level of flexibility has allowed YouTube to not only build up this enormous robust catalog that includes stuff that's never gonna be available on the commercial marketplace, but it also gives students and other people access to huge amounts of music for free. And it's not as hands off as Pandora, but I think it does a pretty good job. But we'll talk about whether you agree with that or not later. Um, the third finding, um, this may be obvious, but when producing or inquiring music, um, Virginia Tech students make it uh, prefer digital. Um, and when buying music, they turn to the big online retailers like iTunes and Amazon. Um, note that we split listening from acquisition or purchasing and acquisition just because they're kind of two different ways you can um, com you know, acquire or interact with music. So anyway. With music acquisition, it's clear that like the top five of them is digital purchases, borrowing music from friends, which I assume is swapping hard drives or um, burning burn CDs that are going back and forth, free downloads off the internet, and then below that is buying CDs retail, either new or used, and then buying music directly from the band is at the bottom, um, which was most most likely be a physical transaction. So clearly, they like the digital purchases or acquisitions. And if you ask them about the digital tracks, if we break that little piece down, 61% say they're buying it from a lot or sometimes from iTunes or Amazon. Again, this is not a surprise. Those are really big retailers. And in fact, iTunes has 80% of the digital music marketplace in the United States. And I'm sure Amazon probably takes up 78% of the rest of it. Um, and then an interesting thing as a sort of a corollary to it is that 57% of the respondents say they rarely or never buy uh, CDs at retail. And um, when we get our panelists up here later, we can talk about this shift from the sort of physical sale of music to digital and see what um, labels and management think about that. Another finding, portability is essential. Um, we asked students about what features are influence your music purchasing or acquisition decisions. And the top five or six were all about um, how important it is that it's transferable, portable. You want to be able to transfer songs to portable players like iPods or uh, MP3 players, be able to play them in your car, be able to manage your library, transfer songs. You want to be able to preview songs. You don't want any DRM or restrictions on use. And then lower down, ensuring that artists 
get paid fairly for the, from the purchase. And then at the very bottom, very little interest in being able to resell the music to a used music store. Um, this is sort of, a, we've already mentioned this, but there is a split um, on the importance of owning physical uh, media. 44% uh, say it's essential or important, and 41% say it's not that important. So um, I'll be curious to see if you guys think that it's shifting into this digital space sort of gradually, or if you've already made that transition yourself, or who here really likes vinyl and keeps buying it. The fifth finding is um, we asked students about what, how music, how important is it in the scheme of all the entertainment and technology and information options you have. So music, while important, is not their most valued source of entertainment. Um, when we asked them to pick three, it'd be like, um, you know, a, if, you had, if you had a budget, um, what three things would you pick that you must have? Um, on a monthly basis, and the big three were internet content itself, like websites and social media, um, then music, then mobile phones, and then below that, books and video games and stuff. You keep... okay. And um, that makes sense, but then when we asked them what is the most important, um, internet content is the winner, and then mobile phones are the second, and then music is third. And I think this makes sense. If I was stuck on a desert island, I probably would pick it in the same, same fashion. And I know it's kind of apples and oranges, like mobile phones is a device and music is not a device, but we all know that all these things do so many different things for us these days. I felt it was like reasonable to put all of these in the same category of things that we pay for frequently um, and, and use a lot. Um, so another finding um, about how students support their favorite bands and artists. Um, we'll show you that they like to promote their, they a lot or sometimes promote the music they like on social nets and amongst their friends. They also can buy tickets to live shows and stuff but then um, less likely to buy merch or join fan clubs or contribute to fan funding projects or, but you know, the least likely thing is gonna be to upload their music to peer-to-peer -to -peer networks. So um, this is a really interesting finding. Um, this makes sense to me too because it's very easy, sort of fi friction-free for us to be able to promote music to our friends, like a little Facebook update and a little Twitter, blah, blah, blah. Um, Sure, we all like to go to live shows, but we all don't live in a s city where there's shows every night, so perhaps um, there's a disconnect between what you'd like to do to support musicians and what you can do based on where you live. Um, and then that goes along with buying merchandise. Most of the time when we buy merch, it's at a show. Um, you, of course, most artists have a way to get it off online too, but usually it's the show where you end up buying things. And then the rest of them, you know, they're super fans out there and they're super for a reason. So the fact that there's not very many folks joining fan clubs is, makes sense to me, you know. Fan clubs are for super fans. Um, then um, we talked a little, you know, we sort of gathered, even though we didn't ask a lot of direct questions about peer-to-peer -peer networking and um, unauthorized music downloads, there, we can glean something from the survey findings and it seems like folks aren't, aren't depending on them as, as much as, um, it's not appearing on the top of the list for some folks. 38% um, 30, of the survey respondents said they never download music off the internet for free. Um, we can talk about whether that's um, what you think is really true or whether even answering that question on the survey doesn't seem like it, answering that truthfully isn't what you want to do. Um, but it perhaps is exactly that way and that there's been so many music services that have developed in the past five to eight years that meet the needs that you have for listening to music or purchasing it that perhaps peer-to-peer -peer activity isn't as relevant as it used to be. Um, and then finally, we did a little, we just ran a little experiment. Um, we asked um, about the price of music, like what do you think is a fair price for a single download? And then we also asked about if you could build, you know, the perfect, music service, what features would it have? What would, would, what would the essentials features be with 
uh, for you. And the reason we asked it is that um, about five years ago, there was this um, theory or this you know, exercise out there that there, or rather, there was this attempt to try and um, have some college campuses run their own music subscription services. The thought being that um, they could get blanket licenses and offer all the music that you could imagine, you know, any music service provides now, for a minimal price that might be added to your student activity fee, say like five bucks a month or something, and all the students on campus could access this huge music subscription service and download or stream music um, and have it feel free because it's just five bucks added to your student activity fee. And um, there was a fellow named Jim Griffin that was going around to campuses trying to get this started and it didn't really go anywhere. And it's really interesting to read some of the reasons why if people are sort of uh, interested in the licensing um, hurdles that are around some of that kind of work. Um, this, the um, report that we have posted on the VT website has links to the articles about it. It was called Chorus. Uh, the concept was called Chorus, and um, it was, I thought, a good idea, but it just was t difficult to get um, going. But we thought we would ask and see what folks thought about it, because it does still relate to what's going on today. So the price for, s if we ask folks what's a fair price for a single song download, they kind of cluster around two prices, 50 cents and 99 cents. Um, we also asked, would you pay more if it was a more popular band, or if it was a more obscure band, or a hard to find track, or if it was a song that could be legally remixed in some way? Because those are three things that sometimes people complain about, or not complain, um, they're willing to pay a premium for. Um, and so this matches what's out in the marketplace, you know, some, you know, Amazon, well, like iTunes has set the price at 99 cents, and even though they have 69 cents and $1.29 tracks, most of the stuff is 99 cents. And Amazon, the same price range, sometimes 89 cents, but I think between 50 and 99 is kind of what the market says it is right now, in the States at least. So with the optimum features of any music service, um, it was, um, you know, a lot of stuff that totally makes sense, you know, fast, reliable access, all the songs need to be portable and transferable, big catalogs of music, <coughs> protection from copyright infringement, and being able to take the music when you down, um, with you when you graduate. And um, as a follow-up to that question, we asked students like, hey, if all these essential features were available, would you subscribe to this service? And 60% of the respondents said yes which was um, interesting. And we asked those 60% of the people, hey, if you were gonna, oh, so you'd subscribe now, what price would you pay for it? If you were paying for it yourself, about 74% um, would pay between five and, well, let's say 65% would pay between five and 10 bucks. Over here, if it was included on a student activity fee where it feels less like it's coming out of your pocket every month, people are willing to pay a little bit more. It's still between five and 10 mostly, but maybe a little more. What I found interesting about this was these, um, the features that folks describe and the price that they're willing to pay kind of matches what some of the things are in the marketplace. Um, there's music subscription services out there that are pretty much fit in this, in this groove. Um, I'll mention a couple now and we can always talk about them, but um, on the, say you really like downloading music and having a whole hard drive full of stuff, like, eMusic is a music download service, a subscription service, so that for 12 bucks a month you get 25 downloads, which equates to about 50 cents a song. And they have a pretty, pretty robust catalog. They've added major label stuff over the years, but lost some indie label stuff in the, in the interim. Um, but then there's music subscription services that are streaming, like Rhapsody, RDO, Mog, Slacker, and Spotify Premium that all fit inside the five to ten dollar range in the states, and offer pretty much everything that's on that optimum thing, um, and with the exception of possibly you'd probably have to pay more for some downloads if you really wanted to keep things forever. But I think we can talk about what the pros and cons are of those services, and whether this a survey like this is sufficient to actually telling us whether people would really pay for music services that are in the marketplace right now um, when everything's competing with free anyway. So, um, so yeah, 
the, those were the key, these are sort of thought discussion points we can talk about. Do these re survey results reflect your own experience as a music pr l listener? Have the legitimate digital, is the, has the legitimate digital music marketplace matured enough to satisfy your music listening and acquisition needs? Um, we'll talk about how artists and labels are adapting to these, this new landscape and how can we, we, the general we, improve the music and tech and artist and fan relationship. So I hope that we can have a conversation about this and also include you all in the conversation too because I think we all can learn from music consumers about how it is to be a music consumer that really cares. So with that, I will bring up our panelists and we'll talk a little bit. Thanks. All right, we have an awesome panel. This is so great. Um, I'm going to actually um, uh, have everybody say a couple words about what they do. So we'll start with Stu. Hello, everyone. Uh, I don't know if this is on. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm Stu Smith. I work at Red Light Management and manage bands. Um, we have a whole bunch of bands from indie to um, pop to whatever. Um, and we also have a, a record label um, and a few different offices around the country. And I'm based in Charlottesville, Virginia. Cool. Spot. Hello. I'm Spot. I work at Merge Records down in Durham, North Carolina. Um, some of our more well-known bands are Arcade Fire, Spoon, uh, She and Him, M. Ward, People like that, and I'm the label manager. Cool. Um, Chris. I'm Chris Winfield. I'm a uh, Virginia Tech student. I work at the uh, campus radio station WVTFM. I'm the music director there, which um, I receive all of the new music that we get and listen to it and approve it. Thanks. Phil. Uh, my name's Phil Norman. I'm a Virginia Tech employee. I work for Network Infrastructure and Services. Uh, in my day-to-day -day job, I get to process all the copyright complaints received by the university. Uh, in my uh, my other life, I'm also a musician and formerly professionally musician, but still recreationally and you know supplementary income musician. Uh, I'm Jesse Burnoff. Um, I'm just a freshman here at Tech. I really like music. I love playing it, collecting it, all of that cool. good stuff. Thanks. I wanted to start with Phil. Phil, since you not only manage the broadband network on campus, but also deal with the copyright infringement complaints. I wonder if these survey results re resonate with what you see as activity on campus from a sort of technical standpoint. From a technical standpoint, we don't monitor, you know, I couldn't tell you what's overall being done on the network. We're, you know, we're very hands off in that sense. I can only, I can tell you, you know, from the perspective of seeing where the copyright complaints come in, uh, it certainly seems that the copyright complaint volume from the RIAA, you know, the music side of that, has stayed the same and or gone down. I mean, certainly a lot of movies and video games and a lot of other things that we get complaints about, but whether or not, you know, that it's representative of how, mm -hmm. how students are using YouTube, like I, you know, I couldn't tell you the statistics on how much right, traffic sure. we send to YouTube. Yep. Um, Jesse and Chris. Um, what did you see, think about the survey results? Did it make sense to you? Do you think it reflects what you see on campus with, with your peers and what you own, what you, what, what you do yourself? Uh, well, myself personally uh, don't use a lot of digital music, um, but it definitely seems like it uh, is how the campus is mm -hmm. um, around me. Uh, I would say it lined up with how my perspective is. Yeah. What about you, Jesse? Yeah, I would totally agree. Um, just like, I guess, for example, just like being in a dorm, you just are around uh, just you know, a little farm of people and everywhere you just, everybody's door is open, music's playing off of their laptops, off of their whatever iPod hookup. It's just people walking around campus with their iPhones or their iPods or whatever. It definitely would make sense that mm -hmm. I think that lines up perfectly. Sure. Um, Spot and Stu, like you guys see music from a very different perspective, but have you noticed these type of trends, like the trends in the way music fans engage with your own roster and your own artists? 
from the recording, sound recording side. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now that's kind of quaint almost. Yeah. Um, but uh, the main thing that surprised me was the YouTube thing. I just had no idea that people just listen to music on YouTube. Right. Like, yeah. Seventy percent of people do. Yeah. I can't imagine it sounds great, but <laughs> that must not be a <laughs> detriment to your own economy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I. I well, the YouTube thing is funny because I feel like the cool thing to me about technology is anytime there's new technology, people just figure out a way to use it to listen to music. Mm -hmm. Even like no one would have thought whoever started YouTube, the guy who started YouTube, probably had no idea that it would be the. I mean, I think there's a statistic like the, the largest, um, the I don't know whatever the biggest reason that people go to YouTube is to listen to music. Yeah. Um, and then that's reflected here. So. But I, I come from it from a, I guess I'm someone who's always been, since I was young, a digital music consumer. So I, 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 and I, you know, didn't work in the industry when it was selling CDs. Uh, so to me, it, it isn't all that much of a change, mm -hmm. but um, you definitely see it. And it all d totally depends on, uh, you know, what band and, and what type of band and what, <clears throat> what the fans are like. Yeah. How you know, old or young they, they are. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start with asking the students too, like um, in in the sort of in the sort of world that FMC lives in, um, there's a catchphrase that we use all the time that you know that um, consumers are shifting from an ownership model to an access model. Um, and it's just a sort of a shorthand way of saying that instead of having a hard drive full of stuff or a, you know, shelves full of records, that, you know, because of the internet and a bunch of different music services, it's kind of like everything's just available all the time. And I wonder what the students thought about whether the, where you feel like you need to acquire it, or, and not only you, but the rest of the students around you. Do you need to acquire it? Do you need to have it and own it? Or is having it up, you know, in sort of the, in the cloud, okay. Is that good enough? From what I've seen, most people um, are, uh, I think it, it wasn't even a, a thing I heard about, like being like the access until Spotify came out in the US a few mm -hmm. months ago. Um, before that, people always uh, were downloading things, uh, either buying it or not. Um, and it's only recently I've seen people really talk about access. I never really had that many friends who just were kind of casually into music um, in a way that they just uh, never really explored. They really just, uh, they, they didn't have Last FM or even use Pandora that much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you see a change? Yeah, absolutely now. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jesse? I, for me personally, it, I still have that whole, I, I want it, I want to own it, I want it in my library, I want to, like, I want it to be mine. I'm, really personally don't really like downloading free music. Um, but I do, like, I remember a couple years ago when Pandora really, like, popped up. And um, so many of my friends are, not so many, but there's a decent amount of them that are just very much about the access, very much about, oh, well, I mean, I don't care, like, as long as I can listen to it. Or I'll be like, oh, yeah, have you heard this song? They'll be like, oh, yeah, I just click on the, you know, whatever channel on. Pandora and it's like it's on there all the time or, and I just don't really understand that because I just feel like I download like the albums of whatever artists I want and then I it's like mine I will always have it rather than like depending on something else to maybe have it. Right. When we were upstairs we were talking about holes in the music catalog which I think I think Chris has experienced like if you have a very you know specific taste in music or there's certain things that you really love and it's not there. What, how does, what do you think when that, that happens? Um, well, it's interesting. As someone who listens to, I guess, um, a lot of obscure music, um, Spotify was actually pretty reliable. Um, but there were certain things I could never find. I, I think it's partly an attitude thing within the indie scene that you don't want. Uh, like the kind of very small amount of money you receive from Spotify, it's kind of insulting, uh, some bands feel. But I know um, I try, I, 
got Spotify, I tried to listen to uh, Big Black, which was a, a, a noise rock band in the 80s, and it, was, it just was not present at all. And um, I mean, you can't find their records anywhere. Um, so that's something I would have to uh, find another way to get it. And there was also one interesting I th thing I found. I tried to listen to the Velvet Underground's uh, uh, White Light, White Heat album. And well, the first side, the first side of the record is there. The second side of the record that was just uh, one 22 minute song um, just wasn't, it was grayed out on Spotify, which I thought was strange. Um, so there's sort of like these uh, holes in the access that it, it isn't completely unlimited. Mm -hmm. You're always gonna find the artist who's stubborn or doesn't really want to or um, even the major label that might not want, that might think, you know, we can make just as much money if it's not free to everyone. We can make them buy something. Mm -hmm. Have you had these conversations with your artists about, do people have different levels of comfort with participating in all these different business models? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the bands that I work with are, um, they let, you know, they want, you know, like the record leaks a month before it comes out, and it's like, yeah, sweet. <laughs> it's out there. People can, you know, uh, um, I think we also get a weekly or daily. I think it's a weekly report, uh, the Big Champagne mm -hmm. report, which tells us um, basically how many people are downloading our band's music illegally. Mm -hmm. um, but it's great because when that's, you know, when someone, when nine million tracks have been downloaded in a week, it means that that song people really want, mm -hmm. people are also buying it. People are also going to the show, and they're also buying a shirt, um, supporting the band in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, even for our massively huge bands, I think people are, uh, I think the artists are get get pretty psyched about the fact that um, you know, that their music's out there, and they also feel that there are enough fans that are willing to, you know, to support them in other, you know, right. financially that they're not going to. Doing this right. Um, I wanted to ask Spot about, or you know, sort of give give Merge a gold star for something you guys did a while ago, which I assume you still do, which is uh, the clientele record you put out in about 2005, maybe, yeah. where the clientele had put out vinyl and CD, and you had the coupon in it. Just in the LP. Just in the LP. So t can you tell folks about that? Well, we we were the. It's pretty much common practice. It's common practice now, Babin. We were the first label to include a download. Yeah, yeah, so. And people were spending so much time ripping the songs from their turntable and hooking up all the stuff that it just made sense to do it that way. Right, and so the coupon, did the um, download code, did you have the MP3s on Merge's website? On our site, yeah. Yeah, do you still do that all the time? Mm -hmm. For every record? It crashed our site when uh, Neon Bible came out. Uh huh. switched to a different server. <laughs> <laughs> but, <yeah. clears throat> ah, that's good, successful crashing. Um, let's see, I've asked you that. Um, you know, it's funny, all this ubiquity of access, uh, ubiquity of content, you know, makes me uh, also wonder, you know, for example, with Stu, what are your artists doing to create exclusive things? You know, are you doing exclusive or limited edition vinyl or um, limited edition t-shirts or VIP stuff? Like what's going on that, cause, because ubiquity is the opposite of exclusivity and I wonder what you do to. Yeah, I mean we do it's on, I mean you have to. Can, ever, can people hear us without the hook? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I work with the band The Decemberists and we just did a, um, a, a big, um, it was hell for me but it was amazing. <laughs> For the, for the fans and everything, we did this uh, exclusive deluxe box edition of their new album um, and did a huge pre-order and this box cost $165 and it um, had, uh, you know, the vinyl, um, a, a photo, well, we so it was part of a larger photo project where Autumn DeWild, who's a great photographer, took 2,500 Polaroid photos of the band while they were out at the studio and, um, you know, basically the most exclude, the most sort of uh, unique thing that you got was a one of one edition, you know, one of a kind Polaroid photo. Um, but anyway, that's just one example. I mean, I think that's huge, and I think the whole idea of a pre-order and getting, 
your fan, you know, motivating people to, you know, give away a track first in exchange for an email address. Um, and then you have this whole base and you can, you know, like with the Decemberists, they doubled their email list through that kind of, you know, fan acquisition period and then offer them these amazing, great, cool things before the, the record presumably leaks or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, we are doing that. We definitely do a lot of, like we manage Tim McGraw and he does a lot of uh, sort of VIP, like meet and greet type things. Um, uh, and then, you know, all the way down to the smaller bands. I mean, you have to, you definitely have to do it. A band I work with, Blind Pilot, just did these very cool, um, uh, similar to like a Moleskin journals. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, they're screen printed on the front and the back. And then on the inside, they uh, created this like custom stamp and they actually like stamp it. And then they, the band like signs their names. So there's a lot of that, that kind of thing that I think. Right. Yeah. Um, one more question for Spot, which is, um, okay, so I've been a fan of Merge Records for a gazillion years, and um, <laughs> and uh, I wonder if the relationship with fans of Merge Records has changed, you know? Because Merge is a, something people really recognize as a, well, its own thing, besides just the bands. I mean, do you guys spend all your time answering emails from fr some people? Do they have suggestions for you? Like, what, what's going on with the fans? I mean, I think we've, we've gained younger fans and our original fans have grown with us, you know. Um, I think one thing we're doing a lot more of is vinyl for hopefully all of our releases, which before it was just such a, for, for a band that's not only going to sell a certain amount, it's hard to, it's hard to make less than a thousand, it's hard to make it monetarily make sense, but it seems like popularity in vinyl has, has changed so that we're able to do that for pretty much every release. Cool. Um, yeah, we don't get a lot of... You don't get fan email? Email. You haven't been getting my letters? <laughs> <laughs> we did around the anniversary, actually. Uh, yeah, I know. No. I was there for the 15th, yeah. Um, right, so... Um, um, the, okay, so the survey suggests that um, some the students... Well, I mean, I'm probably reading too much into this because I only have one data point. I don't have any time frame on this. But um, I, was, I was surprised at the number of folks who said they never download music off of peer-to-peer -peer networks, or they tend to not... Uh, only 57% said they um, download music for free off the Internet. Um, I was expecting a higher number. So I wondered what... Um, you, Phil already mentioned that your RIAA-related copyright infringement stuff seems to be going down, but you had a number from prior years, right? Like, what, was, what, would a, what did a prior year look like as far as copyright infringement notices goes? RIA originally, uh, you know, 2007, 2008, 2009, you know, was a, uh, was a larger ratio of that, but it's, I, I'm skeptical in terms of giving any kind of credence to yeah. that because we don't control, you know, we don't, oh, it's RIAA day, you know, we don't know we're going to get 20 complaints. We get the complaints that we receive. Right. I mean, I think that's, uh, because of this, a lot of these agencies use uh, enforcement agencies, or you know, they, they hire a contracted company to monitor these networks and then send them out. My guess is that it's it's you know part of their contract for you know how much they want to yep. want to prosecute students. I mean, I, I don't. Right. I, I really, I, I'm hesitant to give any credence. Oh, to sure. That. Um, but has VT also um, instituted a, a like a educational? Component? Do do incoming freshmen have a something? Yeah, there's, in, there's information about copyright infringement during student orientation, freshman orientation, and then also it used to be a, a much more heavily involved with judicial affairs when a student was, you know, uh, found to be guilty of the infringement. You know, there was going to a class and writing a paper, and now that's used more for egregious offenders, for repeat offenders. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, it's certainly been an active role. It's part of our obligation under the Higher Education Opportunity Act and DMCA, not only to process these complaints, but to have the, and that's part of why we're here tonight, to right. have the, the educational side of it. Right. Um, I don't want you guys to pretend you have to answer for all students, but I wonder what you thought about that. Do you feel like peer-to-peer -peer network um, activity, people downloading off the, off the file sharing networks, is changing at all? Uh, I could definitely believe that, uh, was it like 40% of people have never done it. Yeah, uh, I can definitely believe that because it's it's somewhat technical, and even mm -hmm. what I see a lot is people um, go to sketchy looking uh, websites that just say like uh, download from YouTube the sound, 
and they get like a bad quality version and I don't know if they even counted that um, or when, when they were, were responding but uh, I could definitely believe that small amount. Sure, right. I feel like I'm kind of the opposite. I'm more skeptical of it. Mm -hmm. um, I can definitely tell you that it would make sense if uh, they were just considering, like, at school they had never really done it because mm -hmm. they, yeah, they definitely warn you in, like, orientation. Like, that's one of the things that stood out. And I know people are, like, actually, maybe even paranoid would be a good word to mm -hmm. use mm -hmm. um, to, you know, like, get caught. Like, they really don't want that. So, therefore, you know, avoid it. Use the free streaming music websites and whatnot or just buy it. Um, but to, I don't think that... Uh, Legitimately, 40% of the people um, would not have ever like ripped music. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that uh, that is like an honest uh, number. Yeah, of, sure. Well, that wouldn't in, include in ripping other people's stuff. Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, we I broke out like uh, sharing with friends as something separate. Anecdo um, anecdotally, this is not empirical because I couldn't give you the numbers, but the shutdown of LimeWire, I think, statistically impacted it, not because of I think because of its easiness. Or you know the simplicity of, of LimeWire for single song, because mm -hmm. what we this is this is a very broad you know uh, demographics stereotyping really is what it is. But I mean you would see uh, gender wise was women using LimeWire, women using the Nutella protocols, and boys using BitTorrent. <laughs> and now it you know it's just in terms of like the you know we saw a lot of the, the video games and movie complaints tend to gender skew male, and the music complaints tend to gender skew female. <laughs> that I mean this is this is. I mean, there's certainly no sociological impact in that, but I think that, that the LimeWire going away, I think may be part of why the music complaint, you know, people were downloading single songs versus where BitTorrent, never technically that apt for single song downloads, more so, more, much more apt for albums or discography. Right, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And there was a sort of general population survey that just uh, came out that pretty much ascribed the, the drop in period of your traffic to LimeWire shutting down last, just about this time last year. So, yeah, interesting. I mean, not a perfect correlation. Well, I think it's more, I think you know, the larger parallel to take from that is the, the move away from the album culture to a, a single culture that happened that yeah. I, I personally don't like, but I think that, you know, the LimeWire side of things was singles, mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. more so than, than, than what the BitTorrent, the other major peer-to-peer -peer protocol we see. Sure. Um, Folks might remember that we also asked about the value of music, and again, I put that in air quotes because you know we all have different values of music. Um, that may, you know, some songs to me are worth a, a bazillion dollars, but um, for the most part, you know, the marketplace says that singles are 99 cents, and you can access big music services for between five and ten dollars, and sometimes less if you're willing to um, put up with ads or other things. So I wondered what students thought, is that a fair price, like for a single? And, you know, is that music subscription price between five and ten dollars? And in fact, the ten dollars being stuff, something that's like super portable and uh, available on your phone, is that a fair price? I mean, to me it sounds, it sounds reasonable, it's just, the matter of like, I guess like the hassle mm -hmm. of um, signing up for something that would be um, like a m you know like a monthly deal with some sort of streaming website or source mm -hmm. like, but really like five to ten dollars for that is nothing because I know that I, you know, I personally like do go on like just like streaming websites specifically because I don't really have money mm -hmm. to like just spend on music though I would want to like every time I'm like at the grocery store or something I just like look at like hmm maybe I'll get an iTunes card for myself or something you know what I mean but because I know if I like hooked up my like debit card to the website that I would just burn through all my money like so <laughs> basically um, it would be a really good deal it's just the I guess even though it wouldn't even take very long just mm -hmm. the time to sit down and be like all right I want to do this sure is, inconvenient. Right, and I wonder too, I mean, I when I looked at the survey results, I was wondering if there was, I mean, Spotify made such a huge sort of splash over in the States when it appeared about July of this year um, because it had, had so, so much high profile press and, you know, it seemed like the time was right for that service to actually 
get some traction in the states because people are like, oh, streaming, oh, I get it. Um, whereas there's been stuff that's existed in the states here for years, like Rhapsody's been around for 11 years or something, which is the, essentially the same thing. Um, and I just wonder if there is a disconnect between what people know is in the marketplace and what they're willing to pay for. Um, you know, what do you guys think, any of you? Like, do you feel like um, that pe enough people know about Rhapsody and just don't care? Or maybe people don't know about Mog? I don't know. I think that part of the brilliance of Spotify is that it, um, they made it so Facebook automatically goes with it. Yep. So. Um, like I had some friends who were like, yeah, I want my friends to see what I'm playing and they use less FM for years. But now, I mean, you can get all of your friends, even the ones that don't care, will see it. And I think there's, I, I think a there's true an appeal music to director. that. Um, I, I think there's an appeal to that, almost definitely. Do um, you think most students know what Spotify is? Now they do, once they see it on their uh, mm -hmm. news feeds and whatever. Well, I also, um, that it's set up very much like guys think of that too? Do you have any comments on that? Um, on the <laughs> on whether enough people know about these services. I mean, I, I assume when you get the royalty statements, there's a big difference between the major players yeah. and everybody else. But we try to, I mean, within reason, be participating as many as we can. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, some are servers of pennies and yeah. some are not. Some know. are big, right. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know how much we've tried to educate people, um, except I do think Spotify is can be an answer to people interacting with music illegally. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, I, I listen to music all the time, and now if I listen to it through Spotify, it's not a lot of money, but it's an economy of scale. Mm -hmm. sure. Some money goes to bands, you know? Yep, yep. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, the Rhapsody question is interesting. I've never used Rhapsody, and I probably should check it out, but <laughs> I feel like there's got to be a reason that, <laughs> yeah, I that mean, it hasn't, it's whether not it's elements. not this, yeah, <laughs> it's the, the I, platform or, or that they don't have enough music. Uh, yeah. or the music that people are looking for. It, it's probably a, a combo combo of things. Um, one of the interesting things is uh, I've been a long time Rhapsody subscriber and when Spotify went live on pen, on Facebook and all these people's music, what they were listening to started to pop up and I was like, oh wow, can I do that with my Rhapsody feed? And you couldn't really do it. You had to do it individually by song by song. Wow. Forget it. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> that was what stopped me from looking at my news feed though. <laughs> <laughs> was it? Because well, kind of, of yeah. It's like, stuff? it's just obnoxious. You know, there's yeah. like so much of that, which I, it's, it's interesting but to a point, but if you're going on Facebook, I feel like you're, you're, you're not just going on there to, to see what people are listening to on Spotify. Yeah. Okay, so I only have two more kind of questions for the panel and then we can chat. So um, one of them is um, this sort of thought experiment about whether college campuses should consider um, having a music subscription service of some sort, you know? Do they have their own VT Spotify, you know? That would feel, that would be basically, what well, would feel free to students, perhaps, instead of you paying 10 bucks a month to Spotify, Virginia Tech pays $10 a month to Spotify and it's just added to your student activity bill. Um, so, um, it would, you know, what do you think, Phil? <laughs> I know you're not setting policy, but, um, you know, is, is should should the students just do you know you know go to the regular marketplace? Um, I think to find that, them? that the the catch to any of those services, I think in, in a you know utopian ideal, they sound fantastic. Mm -hmm. Particularly, could it be a major player? You know, but I think the trick there is that it would have to be a major player coming in. It would have to be iTunes or Facebook or you know some kind of name brand recognition that all the students are already likely to be using, or so fascinatingly, disgustingly easy. And you know how do we how do you put it in front of me with the the campus body here is incredibly diverse. There's 26,000 students, let alone faculty, staff, and you know, hangers. I mean, how do you how do you put that in front of that and make that you know immediately aware and change the habits that people already have? I mean, people don't you know come in as freshmen not listening to music and not having a way of listening to music. I mean, you have to, you would have to make that service so fantastically easy or uh, better mm -hmm. that you know yeah in a perfect world I think it sounds amazing, but I think it would have to come from a major player. 
Do you think it matters? Would you guys be like skeptical of a VT branded spot? You know, like, hey, they're making choices for me. I'd rather go do something else on my own. What do you think? I think at this point, I just wouldn't be interested. There's, or, there's already that stuff there for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, it'd be weird to think that uh, a, a can't like a school could do something um, like that more exclusive or something than uh, any service right now. I suppose for me it would have to depend on whether it is just another like streaming site or if it's something where like do I get to keep the music or is it just another yeah. Pandora, right? That's a good point. Okay, so the last question is uh, you know, sort of a follow up to the, um, the question about how um, students are supporting artists besides purchasing and listening to music. And you might remember that some of it was about promoting music, socializing it to your friends, and then going to shows, and then less likely was purchasing merch and all those things. Um, so I wanted to ask the students, um, do, you, do you see the relationship between yourself and the band you like changing? Um, and, it, I, and I mean this in sort of both ways, like um, it's easier to you know, follow very obscure bands, maybe get really close to them because you can be on their Twitter feed. But does it also change how you support them? You know, do you find yourself going to more shows, buying more merch, buying vinyl? What? What is it like? For me, definitely, like, I guess with the bands that I really do, like, and like devoted to, I'm totally like, mainly contact with them, like, being their like website and just trying to see, like, I'm always like looking up shows, like, if they're ever gonna be close, like, not in Europe or on the West Coast or something, um, but always checking out, like, see, like, all right, when there's the next album coming out, like, when is all this? Because, like, there are definitely people that I would, um, yeah, like, spend, like, a gazillion dollars on uh, their next album or something. But, I mean, I feel like, yeah, I listen to a decent amount of obscure music, so they may or may not be very, like, popular in general, like, not even be able to find their songs on the, like, free streaming music, whatever. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's most, most bands and everything you can find on Facebook and like that, and which is an easy way to track like, oh yeah, like all right, this is where they're gonna be, this is what their next, like what their next project kind of is, and just like whatever like strikes my fancy, I guess, is like how I would follow that. That's cool, all right, how about you? Uh, I think it's um, really, uh, there's like this really, I feel like there's a close relationship because I mean, you can go to a band's Facebook page and you can get all the information and news you want about them, but there's also band members that have uh, like Twitters of their own, and you sort of feel like um, uh, you're, you, you can become more invested um, in a person in a band. Um, most people, have, I'd say most of you I follow on Twitter are uh, band members. They, they sometimes they talk about their records and I find out news to them, but they also talk about their uh, their lives or even post like pictures from the studio of their own instantly. It's the uh, the internet, or they post like exclusive things or make promises for getting like so many followers mm -hmm. after a point. And I think it's really uh, it's become more personal for me. I don't know how much it becomes for uh, like a pop music listener though. Sure, sure. Um, how do you see um, musicians supporting their work in the future? Like I mean, the landscape is clearly changing, and we're moving away from you know, some of the more traditional ways of music, of revenue being generated from being a musician. And I don't mean this as a, um, you know, you know, as being a criticism of what's going on. I mean, it's most, mostly like an adaptation thing. Like, so, you know, we're thinking about innovative ways that musicians and fans can be linked closer together or perhaps building more exclusive relationships or, or really interesting stuff going on. I think there's a lot of really interesting things happening too. So I just wondered what everyone thinks from the, the students all the way to the management about um, how things are changing and how you think artists will, you know, how we can improve this music fan, musician fan connection, you know? That was yeah. terribly No, <laughs> but I think um, having that personal connection that's mm -hmm. possible now, that wasn't possible so many years ago, uh, is really important and it kind of can create what you were talking about the super fan yeah um which 
I mean, I don't think we can depend on college students because they don't have any money. I didn't have any money when I was in school, you know. Um, but, but still having the music accessible so they can become fans of the bands and then, you know, cash transaction later on, you know. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, and and I think vinyl is really important. I think for our, the majority of our bands, having that super fan who will who would want to buy the December's box set or anything like that, you know, is is the most important thing. Yeah, you know? sure. Yeah, I mean, I, w I would say it's just interesting that at my company because we have such a span from like a you know pop, th you know like Alicia Keys we manage, but then we also manage Fish, and they're like, I mean, you can look up their record sales as public, you know that's that that's not how they're making a living, but they're a huge successful band, um, and they've been doing it for a long time. They actually used to like back in the day, they would they had a news letter that they would literally like send like print out and fold up and send to each one of their fans um and their music's been free mm -hmm. so i think that model is the people who want to get it for free can get it for free mm -hmm. and listen to it and you know spread it and and then like i said before there's other ways to to yeah. help kind of support the band sure um, the last there's different perspectives on it. Right. And the last thing I just wanted to ask the students is, is there anything you s could see uh, that could make it easier for you to support the bands you like and discover things that you don't already know about? I mean, if you, if you could talk to the folks at Spotify or talk to the folks at iTunes or whatever, if you could fix something, what would it be? Uh, can I create more time for myself? Yes. To like <laughs> yes, time. That's a good one. I really don't. Uh, think I really can't think of a way to improve sort of that um, from from like like uh, right now it's so personal and so easy no matter what you do um, that I don't think it can really be improved that much from yeah. here right sometimes it's like I've, I mean it's if you want it then it's very like accessible very in your face and sometimes even if you don't want it it's there so I mean there's one thing that I think it's interesting is that um, if you don't have any money now, you can still become a fan and listen to yeah. the band for forever and then buy uh, the more expensive physical releases yeah. later on. That's good. And that's something that's we've seen point. even with the level, you know, the, the band that I perform in now, you know, we do regional stuff, you know, and we, I get a check for, you know, from iTunes for 50 bucks a month. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not somebody making any revenue, but we looked at it for a long time that I'd much rather have a fan than $10. Mm -hmm. You know, like when we've, we've seen people upload our stuff to BitTorrent, I get excited because, you know, at that level, where we are, the, the, the fan thing, the people being broke and still wanting to like us is more valuable than the one sale. Mm -hmm. Then hopefully that would turn into a lifetime of, of sales. That it's a, it's a, yeah, the connection is more important. And I think that's why you see the giving away an email address for a track. The connection is more important than the, the one sale. I mean, the sales still matter. Uh, they're not trying to make light of it or give it all away, but there's a the connection is what you're selling now. Yeah. Well, thanks, Phil. Um, so um, we can open it up to questions or responses or feedback from anything, whether it's a survey or from what we've been talking about. Do folks have any questions? Because we have a microphone, but you can also just stand up and say something. <laughs> yeah. That has is pen to my to my knowledge nothing you know, there certainly that there have been a, some services talked about sort of in a general larger university sense you know not Virginia Tech specific but other universities are talking about how would such a service be feasible but mm -hmm. nothing has really ever materialized I mean it's been talked about for years yeah. And I think that localization of content helps a lot, particularly in terms of if you think about bands that would be touring through the area, or I mean, that may come, may come around. I think that localization of service, and I think that's why Facebook works. Everybody has it, but it's also 
focused on your local communities. You know, you you, fo you form those communities, and we're having a, an, a very large, very vibrant community such like Virginia Tech, I think, would be valuable for a service like that. But nothing that I'm, I'm aware of. How about mm -hmm. that? <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. For us, it's been the best way you could support an artist is just go to the show and buy the record from the artist directly. And uh, that's, that's the best thing you can do. And then, you know, on down the line. But, but, I, but as far as the major amount of their money, I guess you could speak to this. Yeah, too. yeah, because um, we see, I guess, the overall picture and I think it I mean it totally depends on the band but touring's become a huge um, percentage of revenue for a lot of bands the bands that can tour want to tour and that are able to do it in a sustainable way um, but I, you know but it totally depends I mean there's artists that make all their money from selling music or licensing their music mm -hmm. um, and I think that moved that from from an independent musician perspective the the Seeking like mechanical licensing and you know uh, te television commercials, video game placement, that kind of that kind of licensing is a big revenue angle now. And then you know the the, the physical CD side of it, you know we sell that. I consider that merch with the T-shirts. You know the, the physical distribution, brick and mortar distribution is long gone. It was gone before I got off the road in 2003. Mm -hmm. I mean this didn't matter in indie level. It only mattered when I sold you something at a show. You know, the, we, I get more money from the digital distribution than we do from sales. And the digital distribution doesn't cost me overhead in the physical right. capital. You know, so it's a, but I can also now, though, free up that capital and make, I can afford to make CDs at $2 a pop and only a couple hundred at a time and make, I can do a five song EP four times a year and, stay, you know, and keep it fresh and current and not have to deal with larger quantities of scale. And I think that the digital side, you know the revenue there is, is interesting, but the you know I, I, this is only coming from my perspective or from my personal experience, where the money from that my band sees comes from iTunes and Amazon sales, and then I see nickels and dimes from Rhapsody and, and the streaming services. Mm -hmm. It's like, haha, look, this is really cute. Looks mm -hmm. like a cell phone bill for pennies and two cents and three cents and nine cents, and it's really cute. But it, you know, at least at, at the the level where you know I'm not a you know, I'm not making a lot of money, but I supplement my income st statistically significantly yeah. through, through playing music, right. but it's not from streaming services. <laughs> now. And selling, yeah, and selling merchandise at the shows. Yeah. Um, in case you're interested, um, Future Music Coalition is doing a project called Artist Revenue Streams that asks that question in particular. And we're, we'll start in end of January, starting to release re results. We've been working on it for about a year and a half now, and it does vary a lot. Um, as Stu already said, you know, some artists, you know, it's we, we've been looking at things beyond the touring artists, like the um, orchestra player, mm -hmm. the Nashville songwriter, you know, the people that um, don't fit into the you know, what we sort of th currently think of as the musician that tours and sells t-shirts. And it's really interesting to look at how, say, you know, a, f a violin player in a major orchestra, how their revenue streams are changing. But so we'll start, we're starting to release that in, in January. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a card afterwards. Okay. Thanks. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, my name is Matt. I organize the concerts here. Oh, yeah.
Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's that in some ways that's a generalization because um, there are it it vary just the way anything varies. Uh, you know, the amount of it, like if you're saying ten dollars for an album, you know, what the artist is actually seeing at the end of the day, and in the defense of you know a label, and there are great labels out there, and then there are probably some evil labels out there, but. Um, <laughs> You know, like I mean, you could speak to this probably better better than I can, but it all depends on your deal. And and you, even if you know the ten dollars that that you spend for that album, if say most of that goes to the label, it's usually it's it's not like you know they're just filling their pockets. Um, what the label's doing is they're finding a band, they believe in the band, and they're loaning that band money to make an album and to help market the album, and then they have to pay themselves back before they. You know, before that money starts going to the artist. So, I think, but there are situations where an artist is in a, a deal that that you know it, anyone would say is a pretty unfair deal, and they're really not seeing any of that revenue, um, and and won't. So, I think it goes both ways, and uh, you know, it's as far as what the RIA is. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to condone stealing music but uh, at the same time if you know you, you've got to find find your ways to listen to music within your budget and figure out what you feel like is the best way to support the artists that you really care about i don't know if you want to go well i mean just speaking from merge's perspective and again it's it varies across all of our bands but we operate on a profit sharing agreement and uh, so basically we don't start making money until the band does and then so we don't have crazy expenses and and, the, and then the band never makes a penny you know so but again sometimes bands don't make any money and we don't make any money you know it's it's different across the board mm -hmm. right cool anybody else oh great okay Do you want me to take that one? Okay, so um, so the, the sort of basic answer to the question is that copyright law is a national thing. So our laws are ours, and they're a little different in Canada, and they're a little different in England, a little different in Germany. And so um, if you're a company like iTunes and you want to license in all those territories, you have to actually get permission to license in uh, and some some companies or like big labels are have the rights the global rights to license their music and they can give iTunes the permission to to let, have it be available in Germany but that's not always the case sometimes rights aren't anything outside the territory that they started in so it's really complicated it's really complicated and if you're trying to do something like Spotify okay so iTunes is is actually simple in licensing because they consider themselves it's like a retailer like they're selling inventory, you know, in a digital fashion, but they just had to get the permission of the record labels to do it. If you're doing Spotify or something where there's streaming, there's way more people you have to get permission from, like publishers and lots of publishers, you know, and um, so it's complicated. And the fact that, like, Pandora isn't available outside of the United States because there's no webcasting right in some countries. And it's really expensive for them to, um, to go into some countries. So they've decided we're not going to do it right now. It used to be available in some places, but they've pulled back. So it's a combination of complicated stuff, um, the cost of doing business in other countries, and sometimes um, the cost benefit. Like, uh, will, we, will we, running Pandora in Canada, would they make enough money to make it worth it? So there's that. But it doesn't mean that you, as a person living here can't have access to lots of cool stuff because there's so many other things that are, like there's nothing stopping a Russian folk band from using CD Baby 
to get their stuff in to iTunes or Rhapsody or Spotify. All that stuff's totally possible as long as, as, long as they're aware that the system is there. Because it's not very expensive and it's totally doable. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. <laughs> um, does anybody else have anything to add to that? No? OK. Uh, somebody else had their hand up. You? Yeah. I guess you touched on one of the things I was thinking about with regard to online music service, uh, online music services and providing that to the universe, to the university community is, uh, number one, that the quality of the music service in question greatly relies on, obviously, what content there is available. And what content there is available, obviously, is um, widely depends on the cooperation of many different record labels and publishers in that in that um, in that context. And so one of the things that concerns me with the ability to to sort of say online streaming is something popular is sort of the 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 um, the selective withholding of Uh, well, I'll take uh, I'll take the first part, but people can jump in. So the the the, the um, Netflix problem, like you know, that music or isn't available, is sort of a a problem that almost any service would have. And um, you know, there's holes in the Rhapsody catalog. There's holes in the Spotify catalog. There's holes that are temporary, like uh, artists that decide like Coldplay didn't want their record on Spotify for six weeks or something. Um, and then it'll be available later. So that is a problem that's probably never going to go away. Um, and I would imagine like this sort of hypothetical college campus music service would be, I would imagine, I mean, it was, it was tried once, and I should mention that. It was called the Ruckus Network, if anybody remembers that. It was around from like 2002 to 2007, maybe. And it kind of failed. It had too much DRM, and it was kind of clunky. Anyway. Um, I'm pretty sure that was just a, a name that was placed on, like, uh, on um, an existing licensed music service. So it wasn't like Ruckus had to go get all the licenses. It already had them. So I'm getting too far in the weeds here. Sorry. Um, I think, I think um, to your other question about privacy and data, um, data acquisition, I, you know, I think that's a concern amongst all, all of us as we, as we spend way, way more of our time on online interacting with people and leaving little data crumbs everywhere, especially about music, <laughs> our music preferences. Um, I don't know, does anybody have any thoughts about it? Do you ever, does anybody ever feel like 
I think it was Chris that said you didn't want, was it you that said you didn't want to have Spotify going through your Facebook page? Uh, I just brought it up. It doesn't really matter to me. No? Doesn't matter. Okay. Well, but it, it's a sense of, of uh, you know, it's, it's the Google and Facebook question, you know, who is the customer and who is the product? You know, uh, where, where, you know, you're, when you're not paying for something, you, you know, then you're the product. You know, so the question of that data and what you're listening to is valuable to, to labels. It's valuable to, you know, there's a reason why that's willing, you know, Facebook is free. is because you're valuable in terms of being able to place ads and things and finding out what you like and finding out trends and things. So there's a, there's a balance between what you're comfortable with revealing and, and the, the, the value that you feel you receive in exchange from a, from a, you know, marketing, advertising perspective. Ideally, your data, in, particularly in services like Pandora that learn you, your preferences over time, your advertising should get better. It should get more relevant. It should get, but you know, the internet is just full of terrible advertising. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have thoughts? No, I think I have, we have one more question at the back and then we'll be done. Yeah. I think it hasn't affected us as much because we don't depend on popular radio um, to drive a single. Um, and I, you know, I still love albums and experience music in that format. And I think for us, the, more of our fans do than than don't. But it is, I think, it is decreasing with when we have certain bands that, you know, you get a song on House or whatever and. All of a sudden, people buy that song like crazy next week, and uh, and it creates singles. But uh, hopefully, it drives people to what what the band wants, which is usually they go into the studio and create an album. But like you said, you know, people create EPs throughout the year too, whatever. Yeah, and I, th I mean, just one thing on that. I, I think you can usually like you can look on iTunes at the the top album, top hundred albums, and the top hundred songs, and uh, maybe this is a total generalization, but I think the the main distinction between those two charts is the the bands that are on the top hundred albums tend to be more sort of career bands um, that you know that will have the longevity. Which and not not that some of those you know major pop artists won't, but um, typically you know the fans that are willing to buy a whole album are going to kind of stick with with the band. I mean, I just feel like there's, like there's nothing like, you know, like getting to know like the album, like having like, yeah, you might find the like one track right off of some TV show or you hear it on the radio or your friend's like, oh, check out this song. And, but then like for me, it's not just, oh, check out this song. It's like, okay, let's see who the artist is, like see if there actually any quality to them at all. Or if it is just kind of like a lucky break that I like this one song. But once you have that like tie to like, I know there's just like, you know, I mean, I don't even know, like a vast number of just, I guess, albums of, that you, when you're just like emotionally attached to it or anything like that, you know, nobody can replace that. And I don't think you really can get that just, uh, I don't really think you can have the same amount of like love as you can have like for an album as for like one like single. Like maybe you can, but none. Oh, can I say one thing that relates back to, because um, we have an artist, electronic artist, Pretty Lights, who gives away all of his music for free. I just think this is really funny. He also, like a year ago, um, decided to start putting his, all of his music up on iTunes and selling it, and um, he makes a lot of money selling yeah. it, <laughs> even yeah. though you can go to his website, literally, and People he gives it away for free. You know? So. Yeah. 